In the name of Jesus, amen. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus says, do not be anxious. But all I really took from the whole thing is that the grass still gets thrown into the fire at the end of the day, whether or not God clothes it. It's just here one day, gone the next. And so when it comes to do not be anxious, we sort of struggle because it's not like there's an off switch for it. We have checked. We know that worrying doesn't fix anything. It won't add a single hour to my life, but that doesn't mean that I can just empty my brain. Telling somebody, do not be anxious, sort of like telling them, do not have cancer. Like, it's a great idea. Really struggling with how. And if you're not going to tell me, just saying don't be anxious doesn't actually help. It leaves those who struggle feeling alone, singled out, apart from God. Looking at all the peaceful sunsets in the middle of our own private little storms, wondering why it is so nice over there and so not over here. And the chasm between what is and what we wish would be just gets bigger and bigger the more that we think about it. We have tried then to make Christianity the bridge. The way to get from here to over there where things look better, to where nothing is wrong. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Which we have taken to mean if there is such a thing as a God, he should give me everything that I want so that I can finally stop being so anxious. Like if God wanted me to not be anxious about paying bills, I can think of a solution that has a couple of zeros attached to it. Which sounds spoiled when I say it out loud. But when anxiety is the thing driving us to pray, the only result that we're actually satisfied with is that God would take away the thing that's making us anxious. Make me not sick. Make me not poor. Make me not alone. Make me not doubt. Then I won't worry. It makes me understand being spoiled a little bit better. It's not just greed. It's fear. Fear gives us tunnel vision. And we can only see the thing, the thing that we are afraid we can't live without. Fear clouds what we see. It clouds how we think. It takes, seek first his kingdom and these things will be added to you as cause and effect. Like God will give you the stuff you really want if only you seek his kingdom enough to satisfy him first. So, you know, seek first the kingdom of God as a means to an end. God, if I love you enough, will you give me the thing that I really love? How many vegetables do I have to eat before I get dessert? It's cute when it's kids doing it, but this is darker than just childish because it turns Christianity into a measurement of stuff. God is real because the sparrows or the ravens eat. God is real because the grass grows. God is real because I feel upbeat about it. Because the other side of that is that if I was a real Christian, I would have everything I need. People go on TV and try and sell that all the time. And it really only leaves people with one burning question. Where is God? because this stuff isn't working. He promises enough, but we have different ideas about what the word enough actually is. The grass still gets thrown into the fire, and if that is a measure of how much God loves me, don't tell me not to be anxious. The Lord is my shepherd, but I look around and there's plenty of want down here. Not just for the season tickets, but for the kids laid up in hospitals, for those who hunger, for those without homes, for those oppressed. We've got a list of things to pray for sitting on this altar. Do not be anxious. And the only other way that we've thought to avoid it is just as dark. Just don't care about this life. Just think about going to heaven one day, which is terrible. Like, it, it really actually is terrible. You can say don't care about this life, but the whole passage that we have been given today shows us just how much God seems to care about it. He cares enough to feed birds, enough to make lilies beautiful, and enough to put you here in this world because he actually wants you here. 
Religion is not just a race out of the world that God puts you in. He cares that you are a part of it. He cares enough to join it himself. This isn't just a race to heaven if God cares enough to feed the sparrows down here. He wants you here or you wouldn't be here. He loves the grass even though he burns. And saying that you care less about the world that God says he cares more about leaves you calling love meaningless, leaves you calling sin victimless. He cares about what happens down here so much he gives us 10 commandments about how we're supposed to treat each other down here so that we don't hurt as much. Thou shalt not do these things because sin breaks stuff. He gives each other, he gives us each other to love. Racing out of this world just to get to heaven means racing away from God's gifts and racing away from each other. And that's bad. And all of it, it leaves aside the fact that Jesus would enter this world too, clothed in human flesh, not just as spirit. God cares about your body enough to raise it up on the last day. We're not just racing to get out of here. And all of it, we have the wrong idea about Christianity as a sunset on a private beach or Jesus holding perfectly clean lambs in a field that somehow doesn't smell like livestock live there. It doesn't mash with the anxiety that keeps us up at night. And the religion was given to be more than, you know, hey, kid, I know you don't want to live anymore because you got a whole book of things wrong in your life and you're struggling to find some good, but, you know, rub some Jesus on it and walk it off. Seek first the kingdom of God. Then you'll feel better if you do it right. Do you see what the devil does? He takes God's word and he twists it around. We read, do not be anxious, and we have somehow turned it into a law. We have turned it into its own work to be anxious about. We actually get anxious over not being anxious. It's almost cute until we end up so stressed over what we're doing wrong that we shut down, that we strike out against those we love and even start to come to hate God a little bit for leaving us hanging, which I think is the real issue. We have painted a picture of God that does not exist and have come to resent him for it. We have come up with the idea that Christians are somehow above the problems in this world. And then when we aren't, we blame God who never promised that we would be. The grass gets thrown into the fire. You are not above the fray in this world. You are not so special that you won't hurt. I'm sorry. It's just not real. It was never promised. Your anxiety will not extend your life. It might even shorten it. But even without it, your days are still numbered. This is not the promise you wish that it was. Praying hard enough will not keep you out of suffering any more than being very good will. This thing that we call sin, it brings about suffering. We live in a world that is coded in it. We sin and our neighbors sin and it just compounds. We don't just talk about this stuff to heap guilt on top of your anxiety though, but to tell the truth, it it hurts down here. You're allowed to say that. If we can't admit to that, the whole religion is a lie. Christianity has to be more than just pretending there's no such thing as pain for good Christians. It hurts down here. God help us. That's faith. Because he does. Your religion isn't pretending to be above the world, but hearing that God is not either. Seek first the kingdom of God. Because it is not far away. It is not stuck high up in heaven where you will get to it one day when you don't actually need any help anymore. It is not just for the well-behaved. It is not for the ones who just happen to endure long enough to die old, so old that people would say they had a good long life at your funeral. Seek first the kingdom of God because it is not hidden. The kingdom is just wherever the king is. God enters this fallen world for you. The king is not far away. He dives down into the pit. This is our hope. This is what our faith really is. God joins us in this veil of tears to pull us out of it. And so when he says, do not be anxious, he dives into the world and becomes anxious about it himself. He prays through sweat and tears over what is coming, but still bears it for you, for me, for us. The kingdom of God has come near to you, that when everything is falling apart, God would not be far away, and your faith would be more than happy lyrics over a picture of a sunset. It isn't a perfect day with a perfect family, and like a somehow Middle Eastern Jesus who still has blue eyes. That's weird. Um, 
It's uglier. It's this. Dead Jesus hanging on a cross for you. Hurting. He looks like what's going on everywhere else. And it's beautiful. On this cross, I see sin and suffering and death and a God conquering all of it. The grass is thrown into the fire, but Jesus goes there too for you. And as ugly as the picture is, the words for you make it beautiful. Because everything we are convinced will undo us cannot. For Christ is risen from the dead. We heap the whole thing up on the cross. And behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here, near to you and near to me. Jesus grabs everything wrong, rides it into the tomb, and rises again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia, not to abandon us again down here, but to rule this world in a way that only the victor over sin and the grave can. He works beauty in a world that still burns. He works love in a world that still has sinners in it. He promises not to retreat, but to help, to comfort, to save, to endure with us each and every day that we would see it as a gift, not because there is an absence of evil, but because there is a presence of good. Seek first the kingdom of God. See it where the king has promised to be, On the cross, for you, you will not be held above the fire, but you will be brought through it. And this is the beauty of the text for this day. It is not simply a command, don't be anxious, find the off switch. But laying out all of the ways that God will not abandon this world or any of the people in it. When you cannot shut your brain off, meditate on the promises of God, not the fear of what it would be like if he was a liar. Because day by day, God continues to pour out mercy here, even in the face of everything wrong. He is not afraid of these things as we are. Not one of them could keep him in the tomb. And so it cannot defeat you either. Day after day, God pours out new mercies for you, new forgiveness, until at last the day comes when he will finally deliver us from evil. So do not be anxious. Steal yourselves, not upon your own strength, but upon the promises of God that are made new every day. These enemies that we are against are not bigger than he is. And he is not above bearing them for you. Know that the kingdom of God is here today. The kingdom of God is found wherever God's word is taught, wherever his sacraments are administered, wherever our heavenly father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace, we believe his holy word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. Look, God is not far away. He is not the one who abandons, abandons us. He grabs hold of our hands. He works even through neighbors, He commands even grass to grow where there should be none. He surrounds his helpless with his holy angels. Ours is the God who provides not just what the grass needs before it's thrown into the fire, but the path through the fire for you, through death itself for you, and back out again to the resurrection. The Lord is your shepherd, and carried by him, there is nothing that you will not be brought through. We shall not want, not for idols, but for mercy, for life for forgiveness, for peace. Do not be anxious. That doesn't come by thinking less about your fears, but hearing more about your God. He is present here to bring you through. When anxiety builds up, look to your God who bore all of these evils upon the cross for you. Look to the sacrament given for you for the forgiveness of sins and be at peace, not in the bad having to go away, but in the good coming to save you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.